My name is David Lepofsky. I'm the chair of the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act Alliance. I'm also a visiting research professor of disability rights at the Faculty of Law of the University of Western Ontario. Let me show you a billion dollar bungle by the Ontario government. When the government spends almost a billion dollars on a huge new courthouse, said to be the biggest in Canada, it should make certain that it is fully accessible to people with disabilities. Well, they made a series of very bad mistakes. They easily could have avoided all of them. It includes some helpful accessibility measures, but too many blunders. Here is the new Toronto Courthouse on Armory Street in the heart of downtown. It opened in the spring of 2023. We shot this video that summer and added a few things in the spring of 2024. This building totally or partially replaces six criminal courthouses around Toronto. Here are five of the old ones that served North York, Etobicoke, Scarborough, and downtown Toronto. Serious controversy has swirled around the planning for this ill-conceived courthouse, apart from its accessibility problems. Just its accessibility problems alone call into serious doubt the planning for this $956 million project. For half a decade before it opened, and long before any shovels went into the ground, the Nonpartisan Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act Alliance, which I chair, flagged serious accessibility concerns with the government's plans. We did so in these letters to the Ontario government on October 15th, 2017, April 6th, 2018, May 22nd, 2018, May 31st, 2018, June 1st, 2018, and January 21st, 2019. I and others also raised serious concerns at high-level meetings with the government, and when I eventually got to take part in a disability advisory group on this building that the government belatedly convened after our pressure to do so. Many, if not most, of our accessibility concerns were not rectified when this building was designed and built. I discovered even more new ones during the summer of 2023 when I first toured the courthouse after it opened. Some good accessibility features. There are some good accessibility features. For example, each courtroom has power doors. Each courtroom has good acoustics and good space for people in wheelchairs to be able to turn. The lawyer's podium can be raised and lowered. This helps people sitting in wheelchairs and shorter people. Each floor has a tactile braille map of the floor layout, but important accessibility features are missing. As well, they sometimes tried to create an accessibility feature, but messed it up. Long trip to get to this court creates new accessibility barriers. Cramming too many satellite courts from around Toronto into a single mega courthouse in the heart of downtown creates serious new accessibility problems for many people with disabilities who must come to this court from the four corners of Canada's largest city. Many people must now travel much further to get to court. This forces them to suffer through awful and worsening downtown traffic. Many must use public transit. The Toronto Transit Commission, TTC, is still full of disability barriers and heightened safety problems. Some people with disabilities need attendant care or other personal supports when they go out. The longer and harder is the trip to court, the more support they need. Some people have chronic fatigue, chronic pain, or both. A longer, harder trip to get to court saps precious energy that they need for a grueling day in court. Not enough nearby accessible parking. There needs to be enough accessible parking spots right at the courthouse reserved for people with disabilities who are coming to court. There needs to be a short, clear, accessible route from those accessible parking spots to the court's front door. This courthouse includes absolutely no accessible parking spots on the court property for the public. The Ontario government told us that the City of Toronto decides which street-level public parking spots are designated as disability parking. Toronto allocated a paltry six disability parking spots near the court. Three are on the west side of Center Street, across the street from the court, and three are on Armory Street. That is far too few for this huge courthouse. People should not have to race to court at six in the morning in the hopes of getting a scarce disability parking spot. It gets worse. Anyone with a disability parking permit can use these spots. That includes people who are here to shop, not go to court. Nothing restricts those paltry six spaces to people with disabilities who are coming to court. 
This creates new disability barriers. At least some of the satellite courts that this courthouse replaces had free nearby parking, including disability parking spots. In front of the courthouse, they built a big, empty, open plaza. Why didn't they use some of that large, wasted, empty space to create disability parking spots for people attending court? This whole property used to be a parking lot. Around the property are big security bollards to stop cars from driving right up to the building. They could have moved these security bollards further back to make room for disability parking spots while still ensuring building security. They could have built more underground parking levels in this building with disability parking spots reserved for people attending court. In its feeble defense for this blunder, the Ontario government says that there are parking lots within 300 meters, most notably the parking under New City Hall. Downtown parking is expensive. Nothing guarantees that there is a clear, disability accessible, unobstructed path of travel from those parking lots to this court. An unplowed sidewalk can be an insurmountable disability barrier. Schlepping all the way from one of those parking lots can exhaust a person with a fatiguing condition before they even get to court. The government said there are subway stations nearby, but there's no assurance that the route to court from those subway stations will be accessible and unobstructed. The TTC has a spotty record of ensuring that its station elevators consistently work. If the elevator doesn't work, there is no accessible way for some people with disabilities to get out of that station. It's too hard for blind people to find the front door. It is usually straightforward for a blind person like me to find the front door of a major public building, even the first time, not here. How does a blind person get from the curbside to the front door or to other important places? We can get expert orientation and mobility training. Some use a guide dog. Others, like me, use a white cane. My cane sweeps or taps the ground in front of me before I step forward. It lets me know it's safe to step forward. It tells me if there's an obstacle or a step up or down. I usually can confidently navigate by finding cane detectable landmarks. A person using a guide dog relies on what they feel under their feet what they hear, and of course, their dog. A person with low vision can also look for well-color contrasted landmarks that they can see if lighting is good. It helps us when the built environment includes wayfinding landmarks, a tactile cane detectable physical guide or landmark to help us navigate. I frequently can find a cane detectable shoreline to follow. Here, I'm walking on a sidewalk. It has two shorelines. I can follow either of them. One is on one side of me with the edge of the road. The other is on the other side of me. I follow the edge of the sidewalk and the grass beside it. I can easily follow either shoreline. I'm like a boat that navigates in parallel to the shoreline. Toronto has tons of great shorelines. A good example is downtown Toronto's historic Osgoode Hall Courthouse. I've argued a couple of hundred cases there. I get out of a taxi, easily find the big metal fence along Queen Street and University Avenue, and shoreline along the fence. A cane detectable opening in the fence has a nice grass shoreline on my right. It leads me to the start of a wonderful long ramp. It takes me to the front door. This ramp was added over a century after this building was built. The ramp has some irregular turns. No problem. Along the side of the ramp is a good cane detectable edge. It easily guides me to the front door. In contrast, outside the new Toronto courthouse is horrible for me. They set its front door quite a distance back from the three streets next to it, and especially far from Armory Street to its south. I need tactile wayfinding to find the front door. The courthouse is set back too far for me to use sound or echolocation to find the front door. It's good they installed wayfinding to guide blind people through the big empty square in front of the court, but they botched it. This was obvious to me within moments during my first visit. From wayfinding from Armory and Center Street to the front door, there's a string of small, narrow metal tiles built into the paved surface. It is meant to be cane detectable. Had somebody not told me that these tiles were there, I doubt I would have found them myself. Had my cane happened upon them, I wouldn't have a clue that this is a guide to get to the front door. Even after I was told that the tiles are there and are meant to be a wayfinding route, I found it quite hard to find this attempt at a yellow brick road. Even if I do find it, it's hard to use. It requires too much concentration and fine agility with my cane. There is a gap between some tiles. This makes me think I've just reached a dead end. I hate these tiles. Don't ever use them when creating a route like this, especially outdoors. It would have been much better if they had just built a straight, simple sidewalk 
from the curb up to the front door, with grass or an obvious raised edge like a line of planters on either side of the sidewalk. This is not rocket science. What if it snows? I was told that there's underground heating to melt snow, but in a major snow dump, it will not prevent the snow from piling up. The wayfinding route is bizarre. I start at the northeast corner of Center Street and Armory. The wayfinding tiles start a couple of feet in from the corner. Here again, I would never have known what they are for had I just encountered them while walking. I start trying to follow these tiles. Within a few feet, they guide me right into one of those big security bollards that are there to block cars from driving up to the building. Long after the fact, I now suspect that I am meant to be rooted to the left of these bollards, but how on earth was I to know that? I end up slaloming around these bollards, bumping into some of them, trying to figure out where to go. The wayfinding path did not have to go so close to the bollards. Once they led me to the bollards, I'd give up, thinking they could not possibly be a wayfinding path to the front door. The shortest distance to the front door is from Center Street on the building's west side. If Center Street is all parked up, as I show here, you cannot get dropped off there. There is a separate wayfinding path from Center Street up to the front door, using those same lousy metal tiles. If I hadn't been told in advance that these tiles are there as a guide to the front door, I wouldn't likely find them or know what they are for. What if I come out the courthouse's main door and want to go to the east to get picked up on Chestnut Street? There is no wayfinding path marked from the front door out that way. I could turn left facing east and shoreline along the side of the building, as far as I could go. It's normally easy to shoreline right beside a building. Not here. Every meter or two, there is a very hard cable coming down the side of the building, a few inches out from the building. I bump into them. I am shorelined along the side of many buildings. I have never before encountered these. These problems could very easily have been eliminated if the building was much closer to Armory. The big square they created in front of the courthouse is totally unnecessary. It serves no important purpose. It could not have been created to invite protests in front of the court. Courts are not to be influenced by protests. They must decide cases based on the evidence and the law. They did not need to build this empty square in front of the court for security. Court security is protected by the bollards around the building, including ones on Center Street that are much closer to the building. Perhaps the building is set so far back from Armory to give a more impressive view of the building. That would wrongly give accessibility a back seat to aesthetics. Setting this building so far back from the street also creates problems for vulnerable accused people, witnesses, and crime victims. They need a safe way to leave the courthouse and get right into a car without the ordeal of having to go through a huge crowd of news reporters and cameras. Vulnerable crime victims want to leave the front door and get right into a car without fearing harassment by their assailant or their confederates. Setting the courthouse so far back from the street increases these problems. Poor location of service animal relief area. It is great that they created a service animal relief area outside the building here again, however, they botched it. It's too far away from the courthouse exit. Speeding up the video, here's the ridiculous route from the exit to the relief area, following those awful metal wayfinding tiles. I leave the exit, walk forward a bit, and must turn right. Then I must walk a few meters. Then I must know to turn left. Then I must walk a few more meters. Then I must know to turn right. Then I must walk a few meters to reach the service animal relief area. My camera person told me a couple of times that I missed turns. A sign identifies the service animal relief area and even has braille. Is a blind person expected to flail their arms around hoping to find a braille sign? This tactile path is useless for blind people using a guide dog. They don't use a white cane to scan for landmarks in front of them. They can't feel through their shoes that they're reaching a point where they must turn. The animal relief area should have been located a few meters right in front of the exit. A person could come out the exit, walk forward a few paces, and easily find it. This animal relief area is dirt, not grass. Some service dog users told me their dog won't go there. It needs grass. There is a patch of grass right next to this animal relief area, but inexplicably, it is in a raised planter. Service dogs are trained not to jump, whether on people or things, so it's unlikely the animal will make use of this. You don't find a garbage can here to dispose of the dog's output. Problems with the Wheeltrans pickup and drop-off area. People with disabilities who can't use conventional TTC subways and buses may come to court on TTC paratransit, Wheeltrans. Where can they get picked up or dropped off? The government said there is a 42 meter long space designated for Wheeltrans drop-off along the building's west side on Center Street. 
Only vehicles transporting people with disabilities can use it. Yet when we were filming, nothing appeared to stop others from parking there. Every spot on this block was parked up, including a police car. There is no room left for a wheel trans vehicle. Problems with power door operators. It is good that so many doors in the courthouse have power door openers. People with different kinds of disabilities need them. Lawyers lugging computers and court bags love them. Yet at times, the button to open these doors is placed in a position so that the door swings open and hits you. I'm at the main entrance in July of 2023. I push the button to open the exterior door. It swings open and hits me unless I know to get out of the way. That is obvious, terrible design. By May 2024, almost a year later, they had fixed this. Now, when you push that same button beside the left of the two front doors, only the right door opens, not the left one. This was fixed only after the building was opened and after we and others raised accessibility objections. It shows how inadequate was their accessibility planning before it was opened. Trying to find accessibility help from court staff. This is said to be Canada's biggest courthouse. Many anxious people need help figuring out where to go among its 63 courtrooms and many other meeting rooms and offices. It is easy to get lost, especially for people with disabilities. There is a help desk, but it's not at or near the front door when you come in. It's off the main path of travel. To reach it, you must first pass through security, go through to another part of the main floor, and then turn left away from the regular path of travel. I don't show this here because we did not film the security screening area. When I first come in the main entrance, there's no Walmart reader to tell me that there is a help desk or where it is or that I should go there for accessibility help. Some people with disabilities like me need that first contact right when we come in the entrance. I could ask the police for help when I come in the main entrance, but they are set back from the front door and they're busy screening for security dangers. They should not have to repeatedly be pulled away to cover for such poor planning. They should at least have put the main floor help desk right after people come through security. I was told that they did not want to adversely affect the flow of people into the building, yet the current design maximizes confusion. This main floor help desk does not have knee space to accommodate a person in a wheelchair. That violates a mandatory accessibility regulation that the Ontario government enacted under the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act over a decade before this courthouse opened. What message does it send to the public when the government violates its own accessibility law and where the very scene of this law breaking is a brand new court of law? It is good that 15 years ago, the Ontario government accepted a recommendation that it designate at least one official at each court facility as a disability accessibility coordinator. They are especially needed in this huge courthouse. The government said that there are several accessibility coordinators in this building and that two are always on duty at the main floor help desk. That's good, but there are problems. How do people with disabilities even know that there is someone at the courthouse called an accessibility coordinator? Many, if not most people, including, I predict, many lawyers, don't know about this, even though it has existed for well over a decade. The government has poorly publicized it. I tried over and over to get them to do better. On the day we were filming, there was some signage about it on the main floor, but none on other floors with courtrooms. In front of courtrooms, there is signage like this sign in front of courtroom 101 on the first floor. It talks about courtroom decorum, but not about finding accessibility help. Years ago, I recommended that information about accessibility coordinators be posted in front of each courtroom. Once again, a reasonable idea was rejected. In November of 2023, months after this courthouse opened, the government wrote me that it was exploring the possibility of posting signage about this on the floors that have courtrooms. While we're looking at this sign in front of courtroom 101, it is good that there is braille and raised lettering alongside the print. Inexplicably, the braille only says 101 courtroom. It does not give the additional information about expected decorum that the print sign gives. Problems due to the atrium. This courthouse has a massive atrium starting at the ground floor. There are huge windows to the outside this creates problems for a number of people with disabilities. Strong, bright light and glare inside the building creates problems for people with low vision and for some people with autism. When I was a child and early teen, I had partial vision. 
I painfully remember what a problem indoor glare was for me. We warned the building's design team in advance. They said they'd have blinds that would block out the glare. That seemed to me to defeat the purpose for all that glass. On the main floor, it is very bright before going into the atrium area. Blinds, if any, didn't seem to fix that. The main floor is a shiny white. That makes glare worse. Big multi-floor atriums like this have echoes and bad acoustics. That creates problems for some people with vision loss, people who are hard of hearing, and some people with autism. We were promised that this building would have features preventing this. If they installed something to address it, it didn't solve the problem. When you wait for an elevator on the ground floor, you must listen very carefully for an elevator to beep in order to know which of the six elevators to rush to. With this atrium's bad acoustics, it is hard to localize that sound. There are two sets of three public elevators facing each other. That makes it even harder. If you face one set of three elevators, the other set of three elevators is behind you. I had this problem. I have very good hearing. It would be worse for people who are deaf or hard of hearing. The atrium goes up to the fourth floor. It is good that on the fourth floor they installed floor-to-ceiling glass. That prevents anyone from going over the edge and falling to their death. But one floor down, on the third floor, they did not do this. Instead, there is a railing. Above it is open air. Why did they install safety glass up to the ceiling here? Some of the people who end up in criminal court have anger management problems and violent behavior. I had recommended that there be a very high safety barrier here to make it impossible to climb over or throw someone else over. The government didn't listen. Long before construction began, I and others warned the government not to include an atrium in this building. It creates problems for some people with disabilities. Their answer? It was too late in the project to change it. If they had consulted people with disabilities much earlier, and if they'd actually listened to us, they could have prevented this. One of the building's architects objected to removing the atrium from the building design because the atrium was meant to convey the justice system's grandeur or majesty. I doubt that any accused person or witness looks at this atrium and then reflects on the justice system's grandeur or majesty. They are preoccupied with wrenching anxiety about their trial. Again, the designer's aesthetic flourishes should not get priority over accessibility. Had there been no atrium, there would have been more usable floor space. Even after spending almost a billion dollars, this courthouse did not have enough space before its doors even opened. There is not enough office space for all the Crown prosecutors who daily work in these courtrooms. They had to create an overflow Crown's office in another building. Problems with the main floor staircase. On the main floor is a major feature staircase. It goes up to the second and third floors. There is no need for this staircase. The public has other accessible and far better ways to go to those floors. Elevators and an escalator. Notice that no one is using this staircase. That is no surprise. People coming to court lugging computers, boxes, and trial bags full of documents won't want to haul them upstairs. They will use elevators. Some architects love to include a big feature staircase in a public building. It may be an artistic flourish. It wastes public space and public money. We had quite a fight over the design of this staircase. It is good that the government's pre-construction specifications required that stairs have closed risers, not open risers. In an open riser, the space between each step is open, not closed. That's a tripping hazard and an accessibility problem. Despite that mandatory requirement, the government selected a design for this building that included open risers. We had to fight hard to get them to agree to change the design and to use the safer closed risers. It appeared to me that the designers felt that open risers were visually more appealing. If so, then aesthetics would again wrongly get priority over accessibility. They eventually and reluctantly agreed before construction began that the risers would be closed. So, why does the bottom step here on the ground floor have an open riser? I felt it as I started walking up these stairs. Did anyone check this building to see if the builders obeyed the government's mandatory accessibility specs before they paid for the building? Problems with the public elevators. There are only six public elevators. They estimated that 1,000 to 1,500 people would come to this courthouse each day. 
there are three other private elevators just for the judges. The public cannot access them. If so many people come to court, there could be quite a wait for elevators. The day I was filming, the courthouse seemed to have far fewer people than expected. I'll explain that later. The elevators have accessibility problems. It is good that they put braille and raise print letters by the elevator buttons. We blind people need that to get the elevator to go the floor we want. But here, they screwed up. In some cases, the braille number is not lined up at the same level as the corresponding elevator button. It is a bit below it, at an angle to the left. Also, the ground floor is labeled in print as ground. But on this elevator, the corresponding braille makes no sense. There is a symbol for a star. That tells me nothing. After it, there is a braille D. What does D stand for? I have no idea. Did they mean G? Did anyone proofread this braille? It is good that an electronic voice announces the floor when you arrive. However, in this elevator, it is not loud enough. Here you can barely hear it say second floor and then ground. Had the elevator been filled with people talking, it would have been hard to hear the floor announcements. What if there is an emergency and the elevator gets stuck? It is good that the elevator has two-way communication with security. There is a hearing induction loop for people who are hard of hearing. But what about people who are deaf? They need a way to communicate in an emergency by text. These elevators include nothing for them. That is needed in any public building. It is especially important for a large criminal courthouse. You might get stuck on the elevator with members of rival gangs from around Toronto, whom this courthouse brings together in the same place and who have no love lost for each other. People charged with violent crimes are here. An accused person and victim could end up on the same elevator alone with each other. Problems with indoor wayfinding. We blind people need tactile wayfinding to navigate inside a huge public building like this. It has large open spaces with no shorelines to follow. In contrast, it is easy to navigate inside a more traditional office building. We could easily shoreline down a hallway, counting doorways we pass to get to our destination. It is good that they included some tactile wayfinding guides on the floor in some parts of this building. Here I am inside this building using my cane to follow one of these wayfinding markers. However, there are also some entirely preventable problems. When I come in the main doors, there's a good path of carpet to lead me towards the security screening area. A simple cane detectable path of carpet can be great for wayfinding. I'm not showing that because it is part of the security screening area. It is also good that the main floor has wayfinding to direct me after I clear security screening to get to either the help desk or to the elevators. It has cane detectable raised lines along the floor. However, there are some parts of the main floor where wayfinding is needed, but there is none. Here are two examples. When you take the elevator down to the main floor and want to leave the building, there is no wayfinding to guide you through open spaces to the exit. The designers did not have to make this so hard to navigate. Second, on the main floor there is one courtroom. There is no wayfinding to guide me through a big open space to get to it. Right in front of that main floor courtroom there is a bizarre short wayfinding path on the floor. It goes from that courtroom's door across the hall to the opposite blank wall. When I first found it, it made no sense to me. There is nothing on that blank wall that I might want to find. Let's go to the sixth floor. On the sixth floor, after I leave the elevator, there's a tactile wayfinding path on the floor. If I turn one way, it leads me towards a hall where there are courtrooms. But that tactile path stops dead in a wide open area. That is where I need wayfinding the most to direct me beyond this wide open area. What if I left that elevator and turned in the opposite direction along that wayfinding path? It leads me to an accessible electronic kiosk. I can look up a case to see what courtroom it is in. That's great, but it also leads me to collide with that kiosk. That can hurt, believe me. Had they just put a cane detectable warning, like a floor mat or carpet square in front of it, it would cue me to slow down before slamming into it. We lawyers tend to rush quickly around in a courthouse. We don't expect that a wayfinding path will direct us to slam into a piece of waist-high furniture. 
It is fine that there is no wayfinding path down the middle of a hallway that has courtrooms along it. We can use the side of the hall as our shoreline. Here, they put a weird tactile wayfinding path cutting across the hallway from the courtroom door on one side to the blank wall on the other side. It is a path to nowhere. Again, it makes no sense to me. I've subsequently been told that this is to prompt me that I've reached a courtroom. However, in all my white cane training and my years of independent travel, I've never seen this before. I'd never know that that is what the designers are trying to tell me. I'm told that this path of tactile warning is not color contrasted with the floor. It needs to be color contrasted to help people with low vision. Sighted people also need this to avoid the tactile markings becoming a tripping hazard, especially for people wearing high heels. I asked one of the building's designers why these weren't color contrasted. I was told that it was a design decision. That is code for treating aesthetics as more important than accessibility. Why is it that these indoor wayfinding paths have no color contrast, but several other wayfinding paths inside this building do have color contrast? Retrofitting this afterwards to correct this blunder will cost much more than including color contrast when the building was built. It's actually better to use a path of carpeting for wayfinding. It won't be a tripping hazard. It's easy to color contrast. It's easy to shoreline. Problems with bathrooms. This building does not have enough accessible bathrooms for people with disabilities. Let me explain the difference between accessible and universal washrooms. Both are equipped to accommodate people with disabilities using mobility devices, such as a wheelchair. Both can have a change table for babies. The important difference between them is that a universal washroom also has an adult change table. An accessible washroom does not. It is very important to have consistency when it comes to accessibility features. This building does not. It is confusing figuring out the availability of washrooms to meet the needs of people with disabilities. The situation is not the same on every floor. Each floor that has courtrooms on it can have from one to eight courtrooms. Each floor has one public women's washroom for the public, lawyers, accused people, witnesses, and others. Some, but not all floors, have one public men's washroom. None of those public washrooms designated for men or women have an accessible stall. Each floor also has an accessible, public, all genders, single-use washroom. Anyone can use them whether or not they have a disability. Only a minority of floors have a universal washroom, one that is accessible and that has an adult change table. They are on the 1st, 3rd, 4th, 7th, 10th, 13th, and 16th floors. Try keeping this straight in your head, especially when you really need to find a washroom and when the judge expects you back in court on time. We told the government that every floor should have a universal washroom. If people with no disabilities use a floor's accessible or universal washroom, then people with disabilities have nowhere else to go on that floor. The government didn't listen. Do you need a universal washroom? It is hard to find out which floors have one. On a tour in the summer of 2023, I was told there is no signage telling which floors have one. You have to find and ask an accessibility coordinator. You may have to go down to the main floor help desk. Don't count on getting the right information. In July of 2023, I asked an accessibility coordinator at the main floor help desk which floors have a universal washroom. He did not know. He seemed confused between an accessible washroom and a universal washroom. He was not sure what washroom facilities were available on the floors above the first and second floors. I'm told the government subsequently decided to review its signage. For almost a billion dollars, they should have been able to get this right the first time. When we take a closer look, it gets worse. The ground floor has three public washrooms, a men's room, a woman's room, and a universal washroom. But good luck finding them. They are far off the beaten track by the coffee shop. There is no tactile wayfinding to lead you there. Even worse, these washrooms don't face the ground floor open area. Instead, they are hidden on a corridor off the main floor open area. To get to that corridor, you have to find and open this door. This door leading you to the corridor where the washrooms are located was not designed with proper signage. As of July 2024, there is just a print paper sign at eye level that says public washroom. Above the nine-foot door, there's a pictogram sign. There is no braille signage at all. That sign cannot be seen from parts of the atrium due to the position of the escalators. In the main floor universal washroom, it's good that there are push-button controls to open the door and to lock it. But there is no braille label for these buttons. The print labels are, at the very least, unclear and hard for sighted people to read. At the sink, the tap is not operated by a motion sensor. You have to manually turn on the water. 
in a well-designed universal washroom, they should have included the obvious accessibility feature of an automatic faucet. If you are blind, you cannot trust the braille signage on this courthouse's public washrooms. Here on the sixth floor, the leftmost public washroom sign says it's a women's washroom. There is no accessibility symbol in print. The misleading braille sign incorrectly says universal women. Looking inside, we see three stalls with narrow doors and no grab bars and no change table of any kind. This is not a universal washroom with an adult change table. It is not even an accessible washroom. That's a swing and a big miss. The middle washroom print signage says all gender accessible, but the braille gives no indication that it is accessible, only that it is all gender. A look inside confirms that it is accessible with grab bars, a low toilet, and a big space in the middle to turn a wheelchair. So far, the sixth floor public washroom braille signage is O42. This washroom has an automatic door opener, but the button outside to operate it is too far from the door. I estimate it at about 45 centimeters. That makes it hard for blind people to find. It should be close to the door. The third public washroom's print sign announces it as a men's washroom with no accessibility symbol. Yet the braille says it is a universal men's washroom. Looking inside, it is not a universal washroom or even an accessible washroom. This floor's public washroom braille signs get a big O for three. The 13th floor has three public washrooms. The women's washroom on the left has a print sign that has no accessibility symbol. The braille sign says washroom, women. Inside, there is no accessible stall. All good so far. The second public washroom in the middle is an all-gender washroom with an accessibility symbol in print. The braille signage gives no indication that it is accessible, but a look inside shows that it is. So far, 13th floor public washroom braille signs are one for two. Once again, the power door operator outside is too far from the door. Further to the right is the third public washroom. Its print sign says it is all gender and universal. The braille sign correctly says all gender universal. A visit inside confirms that all the signage is accurate. The record for the sixth and 13th floor public washroom signage combines to two for six? Pretty bush league. Among these three public washrooms on the 13th floor, the women's washroom on the left, the accessible all-gender washroom in the middle, and the universal all-gender washroom on the right, are three troubling inconsistencies. These add to all the confusion. First, the universal washroom's outside door opener button is close to the door, as it should be. In contrast, the door opener button for the accessible washroom is at least 45 centimeters away. That's too far. Second, the automatic door opener button for the accessible washroom is to the right of the door. In contrast, the automatic door opener button for the adjacent universal washroom is to the left of the door. Third, the washroom signs are not in a consistent location. The signs for the women's washroom and the accessible washroom are both to the right of the door. The sign for the universal washroom is to the left of the door. What were these well-paid building designers thinking? Are we blind people expected to stand there, running our hands up and down the wall on both sides of each washroom, to figure out which one to use, and where the door opener button randomly happens to be? That's hardly dignified, especially when you're rushing to go to the washroom. They were consistent about one thing, but it's a bad thing. None of these washroom power door operator buttons have a braille sign saying what they are. Problems with the third floor court services office. One of the first places a person may need to go is the court services office to file papers or take other important steps. It should have been on the first floor and easy to find. It isn't. It's up on the third floor. When you find it, get ready for disability barriers that we warned the government about before construction began. When you enter the court services office, you have to wait your turn to talk to one of the court staff members at one of the eight counters. However, there is no designated place to line up and no queuing area. There is just a wide open area in the middle of the room. You must take a number and wait your turn. The electronic kiosk where you get your number is inaccessible to people with print disabilities, such as blindness or dyslexia. I cannot operate its touchscreen. That violates regulations under the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. They require new electronic self-service kiosks to have accessibility features. It also violates the Ontario Human Rights Code ban on discrimination because of disability. And, of course, the Charter of Rights. That electronic kiosk should be right inside the door. It is not. It is on an opposite wall. 
I'd have to magically know it's there. This inaccessible electronic kiosk produces a number in print. That is not accessible to me, to other blind people, or to people with dyslexia. When on a tour, I asked how a blind person is to use this machine. I was told that they could get help from an accessibility coordinator. How am I supposed to do that? I need to ask at the service counter, but I need a number from that inaccessible kiosk to get in line to talk to someone at those counters. Catch 22. I guess you could go all the way back down two floors to the main floor help desk and ask one of the accessibility coordinators there to come back up with you to help operate this inaccessible electronic kiosk. Is this accessible customer service? After you get your number, how do you know when it's your turn and which counter to go to? You have to watch for your number to come up on a monitor. That is yet another barrier for people with vision or other reading disabilities. Why not announce them out loud as well? I had a go-round with the Ontario government over this very kind of disability barrier a decade ago. They posted numbers to be served on a monitor like this at a Service Ontario location in Toronto. Senior government officials were quite embarrassed. I was told they fixed it at Service Ontario years ago. Ten years later, this new courthouse creates the very same obvious disability barrier. When you get to the counter to speak to a court services person, there's a security barrier or plexiglass from the top of the counter on up. There are a few holes cut out to speak through. This creates an unnecessary barrier. Members of the public need to speak louder than necessary to communicate. That can impinge on their privacy. I was told that the plexiglass was meant to prevent members of the public from lunging over the countertop, endangering court services workers. I was shown a mock-up of this design for feedback well before shovels went into the ground. I told the government that this was a barrier and that they could achieve the same security by just putting bars or wired mesh there instead of plexiglass. They did not listen. Two of the eight service counters are at an accessible height. Why not all eight? I was told some people without disabilities might not want to have to lean over to sign something. An easy solution would be to put a movable box on the counter for someone to use as a signing surface if they wished. It is good that there is an assisted hearing loop for people who are hard of hearing and who have a compatible hearing aid to receive audio from this system. However, there are only these hearing loops at two of the eight service counters. Why not have them at all eight? That would eliminate the need to request this accommodation using that inaccessible electronic kiosk. Obstacles sticking out from the wall. Nothing should ever stick out into the path of travel. On the sixth floor, a defibrillator sticks out from the wall. In the third floor court services office, that inaccessible electronic kiosk also sticks out from the wall. In both cases, there is no cane detectable warning at ground level. My white cane tells me it is safe to walk, but my body can whack into these obstacles. It would have been easy to embed these in a wall so that they don't stick out. These are obstacles for anyone who is distracted while walking, like someone texting while walking. Barriers with the Wheeltrans indoor waiting area. If you have a disability and need to use Wheeltrans to get home from court, where do you wait for your pickup? Their original plan was to make you wait here, in the vestibule between the inner and outer courthouse doors. There's nowhere to sit. There's a partially obstructed view of the place where Wheeltrans vehicles are supposed to park. I was told this was later changed due to security concerns. Instead, a seating area is set up well inside the building, even further from the Wheeltrans pickup spot. This Wheeltrans waiting area does not have a line of sight to the Wheeltrans vehicle pickup spot. The Wheeltrans driver can't see into the building to know if you are waiting there. The courthouse provides a video feed from the pickup area to a video monitor in the Wheeltrans waiting area. But there are big problems. First, on the day when we shot this video, the video monitor was black. It was not showing any video feed of the Wheeltrans pickup area. Second, what if you are a blind Wheeltrans passenger? You are out of luck. You cannot see the video monitor. I was told you need to ask an accessibility coordinator, but none are stationed in this waiting area. You'd have to track them down and ask them to drop what they are doing and wait with you. Wheeltrans gives you a 30-minute window when they may arrive. That accessibility coordinator would have to sit with you for up to 30 minutes because of this bad design. Third, even if the TV monitor had been turned on, there is no assurance that sighted people waiting in the Wheeltrans waiting area will see their Wheeltrans vehicle when it arrives. The outdoor camera is aiming at the area on Center Street that is supposed to be reserved for Wheeltrans pickup and drop-off. However, if others park in those spots, the Wheeltrans vehicles will stop somewhere else, outside the view of the video camera.
there is no one monitoring for this to alert people waiting inside for their wheel trans vehicle. When we shot this video in July of 2023, I asked the court accessibility coordinator staffing the main floor help desk where the wheel trans waiting area is. He had no idea that there was such a thing as a wheel trans waiting area. It was only a few meters away. I hope they are better trained now. Some waiting for wheel trans may decide that the safest bet to not miss their ride is to wait outside at Center Street, where wheel trans vehicles can stop. They don't want to miss their ride. They can't book another ride on the same day. However, in the middle of a hot summer day, or a freezing winter day, they won't want to wait outside for the wheel trans 30-minute pickup window. If you are a vulnerable crime victim or witness who just gave evidence, you would rather wait inside the courthouse where there is security than outside the building where you are a sitting duck. Conclusions The government says they had expert accessibility consultants on this project, but neither the government's project compliance team nor the private bidder who won the contract to build this courthouse were required to listen to those accessibility consultants or to account to the public for bad decisions when they did not listen. There's no real accountability here for all these accessibility blunders. Beyond these accessibility blunders, replacing Toronto's satellite courts around the city and dragging everyone downtown was a really bad idea. It created major labor relations problems with court staff, who must travel much further and pay more for parking just to get to work now. It daily led many courtrooms to be closed during the building's first month because of staff shortages. Delayed criminal trials caused chaos. This led to some criminal charges being thrown out for unreasonable delay, contrary to the Charter of Rights. This mess was as predictable as were this court's accessibility blunders. Making this all worse, the government eventually decided that most bail hearings would be dealt with at another location, 2201 Finch Avenue. It's at an old building with no nearby subway station, far from much of Toronto's population. Talk about creating more barriers. What has the Ontario government done in the face of the accessibility problems in this courthouse, about which they were warned years in advance? First, they asked for more accessibility feedback, months after the building's construction was done and the doors were open. I've repeated many of things I've been saying for over a half a decade. They've hired an accessibility consultant to do a report on wayfinding problems. That's the very same accessibility consultant who had already been retained by the winning firm that built this courthouse. They've hired a second accessibility consultant to give feedback on other disability barriers and how to fix them. All of these costs could have been avoided. The public deserves to know who made all these poor decisions and why good accessibility advice was too often ignored. The government engaged the Rick Hansen Foundation to provide a private accessibility certification of this courthouse. That was a waste of public money. We've been on record for years raising huge concerns with the seriously deficient Rick Hansen Foundation program. It doesn't certify anything. It doesn't ensure that those who audit a building have sufficient training and expertise to conduct such an audit, take enough time, or consider all accessibility needs. The fact that a building is dubbed accessible by that process does not mean it is really accessible. This courthouse proves our point. The Ontario government told us that the Rick Hansen Foundation awarded it a gold rating for accessibility, their top rating. That shows you that you cannot rely on the Rick Hansen Foundation for determining the accessibility of a building. We have no idea if they took into account any of the serious accessibility blunders that we have been raising with the government for the past five years. No one doing this Rick Hansen review contacted us as part of its review for our feedback. What lessons can we learn from this? The Ontario government needs to revamp from top to bottom how it spends the public's infrastructure dollars to avoid these recurring blunders. All decisions on infrastructure accessibility should be publicly documented so that we can hold accountable the private companies, architects, and government officials who make poor decisions behind closed doors that hurt us all. Strong, comprehensive, mandatory new accessibility standards must be enacted now for the built environment. We've been pressing for this for well over a decade. The Ontario Building Code remains woefully inadequate. We also need a major retrofit on how design professionals are trained and licensed in Ontario. They should be required to learn how to design buildings that are accessible and that everyone can use. 
Those who were paid almost a billion dollars creating a courthouse like this with preventable disability barriers should have to pay to fix those barriers. The taxpayer should not get stuck with the bill for fixing these blunders. Learn from these mistakes so that future buildings don't bungle accessibility. Learn more at www.aodaalliance.org and on Twitter at AODA Alliance.